and welcome to our first Feature Engineers Bangalore meetup that we're streaming around the world. I'm Amelia Meek, and I'm the founder of Beta Science Connect, as well as the organizer of the Feature Engineer Meetup community. We have of nearly 1,000 feature engineers across the world, spanning cities like Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, and Singapore. Audience of nearly 100 feature engineers in Bangalore and India. Give us a shout out in the chat and tell us what city we should come to next. Now, before we get started today, a few housekeeping items. Is there a bad echo? All right, sorry. I think that's like it. All right, let me start over quickly. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our first Feature Engineers Bangalore meetup that we're streaming around the world. This has not been without its technical glitches, uh, which is the nature of the virtual space. Um, and we're excited to announce that today we are um, doing a hybrid event. So we are streaming virtually and we're also in person. I'm Amelia Mink founder of Data Science Connect, the largest data science community in the Southern United States, and one of the most recognized data science communities in the world, as well as an organizer of the Feature Engineer Meetup community, made up of nearly 1,000 feature engineers across the world, spanning cities like Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, Singapore, and Bangalore. Today, I'm excited to announce that we're joined by a live in-person audience of over 100 feature engineers in Bangalore, India. Give us a shout out in the chat and tell us what city we should come to next. Before we get started today, a few housekeeping items. Please take advantage of the ask a question feature button throughout the talk and upload the questions that you want answered. Uh, this will be a fun way to make it interactive and uh, you'll be able to, to kind of hear what folks live are asking um, and they'll be able to, uh, to hear what uh, the virtual world's asking. So it'll be a, kind of a neat way to, to hybridize the day. Um, also to make this feel a little more in person, we suggest you add a photo to your profile Include your bio, LinkedIn profile, and other information you want attendees to see in there. Now onto the program. We want to thank Mobile Walla for making today's hybrid event possible. Mobile Walla provides innovative data solutions that help data and marketing professionals better understand their customer, enabling them to build more precise AI models that better analyze and predict consumer behavior and drive business results. You'll also hear today about their open source platform, Innovos. Anovos offers a comprehensive feature engineering solution for data scientists, including data ingestion and cleansing, drift and stability analysis, and stable feature creation via feature recommendation and transformation. Take a moment and join the Anovos community by selecting the bottom, the button at the bottom of your screen. Today, we will discuss one of those steps, arguably one of the most important um, in the data science lifecycle, EDA, also known as exploratory data analysis. This session will dig into the key activities in EDA and discuss new ideas and tools for how to improve the process and outcomes. We will also hear from industry leader Symphony AI, a global enterprise AI solutions company on their strategy around EDA and auto feature generation. Without further ado though, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Anindya Dada, founder and chief executive officer of Mobile Walla, joined by Neha Makicha, Product Manager of AI and ML Enterprise Solutions at Symphony AI. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoy the program.
Good here. Good health. I, I should be good, right? No, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, they appear to unmute. So I can't. I can't. Yeah, I can't. Uh, hang on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, we go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'm good. Should, should you uh, come in? Just, just let's. Uh, how do and then I... you, can we see your camera too? No, you are already sharing your screen. I think it's good. Yeah, it's it's okay. Yeah. All right. So hopefully this can be this. We can start. Yeah. So again, um, um, thank you for thank you for coming. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the, the, the objective was to talk about EDA. Uh, EDA is, of course, a very broad topic. Uh, so the idea was to talk of EDA in the context of building predictive models. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to team with, with Neha uh, uh, in, to do this presentation. <clears throat> and the goal is, the, the goal of the presentation is twofold, right? So, uh, and, and it goes into, you know, what we've been doing at Mawulwala. So the goal is, hey, can we define a canonical EDA pipeline for modeling, right? In the sense that, that, that of course, EDA broadly applies to, you know, you could be doing hypothesis testing in statistics. You'd also do some EDA for hypothesis testing. So the thing is, you know, EDA is very broad. Can we narrow it down into its essential components for predictive modeling? And the second thing is that if we can do that, if we say that, hey, here are the 29 different things you need to do, can we dig in a little bit and think about how that is done now, right? So, so how, how talk about how, is EDA easy? Is EDA hard? What are the problems? And look at some, some you know, envision some solutions that can address those problems. Now, of course, the idea is, you know, in Mawulwala, we have been working on this um, um, effectively a software stack uh, to do feature engineering for a while now. We have launched it as a uh, open source uh, package. And part of that is EDA, right? So, so hopefully, hopefully what we can talk about is hey, here are the here is what it takes to do good EDA for modeling. Here is why it is hard. And here is what can make it easy. Right? So that, that's the goal. So let's start. Um, again, this is, you know, I won't spend too long on this slide. I mean, I think everybody, you know, if there is someone who doesn't understand what data analysis is, raise your hand. But I think we, we, we all understand it. And I just wanted to I just wanted to make clear that EDA is 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 not specific to data science or to AI. I mean, EDA applies to you know traditionally, those of you who have studied statistics in college. In order to do any statistical analysis, you need to understand the data first to see hey can I, will this lead to good good, you know, you want to do hypothesis testing often. You don't know what hypothesis to hypothesize, right? So, so, so you start out looking at the data and see things like, hey, what are the patterns I see? So you're gonna just formulate hypothesis. Right? So EDA could be used in anything, right? So, so, what we are most interested in is the EDA to build predictive models. So you are a data scientist. You are building a model to predict some outcome you are going to use data uh, to be able to do that. And, and you want to perform, you want to analyze the data, right? So that's, that's what we are talking about. So in that circumscribed domain, in the domain of, of analyzing data in order to build good models. So what we believe is that EDA has two specific goals. The first goal is, let, and let's just assume for this discussion, we are looking at tabular data. It doesn't have to be, okay? But still it turns out that probably a majority of models that we build ends up using tabular data in some form. So just, just yeah, you know, the, the discussion extends to non-tabular data as well. But when using tabular data, what you're trying to do is, is analyze basically every attribute right? to see 
does it lend itself to good model? Basically, is it is 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 is, is the data model friendly? And then, if there are issues, you want to fix them. Right. So usually, when data comes in, it's not clean. There are issues, um, and you want to fix them. So these are the two goals. Hey, does is the data model friendly? If not, can I make it right? Some examples, some examples. So in the first goal, you know, you may standard things that we look at, right? Are there attributes with ton of nulls, right? Are there, uh, does, uh, I pull an attribute, does it have a lot of missing values, right? If it does, what can I do with it? Does it have too many missing values that it's unfixable? Then I just throw it away because it's not going to leave. But, you know, if it, if it, if it, uh, if it has 70% missing values, you throw it away. If it has 20% missing values, then maybe you can impute, right? Maybe you can you can fill in those values using some, some method. Are there attributes with outliers? Right. So if I if I break down uh, numerical attribute, I break it down in percentiles, right? Is there a huge difference between my 99th percentile value and my max value? If so, then then possibly you have outliers on the on the right, right? So so again, do I are there so many outliers that I need to throw it away, or can I take out the outlier values and replace it with something? You know, with the mean, with the median, with the mode. I mean, there are there are established methods, right? Are there groups of attributes that are that are strongly correlated? If that if if you have a bunch of attributes that are correlated clearly it doesn't lead to very good modeling because any if you take a group of, of, of related attributes, any one of them is kind of including the effects of the others, right? So if I do, can I pick one member of that group, right? Which member do I pick? Maybe I pick the one with the highest information value, right? I mean, there are other ways, of course. Are there categorical attributes that have tons and tons and tons of Values, right? Are there high cardinality? As as most of you know, eventually, learning algorithms. Oh, it's not moving. No, that's going to broadcast. So just just to Emilia and Stephen, what's happening is that the deck is not moving. Okay. How do I get back? Uh, click to close messenger. <clears throat> okay. So let's see. Okay. I, I moved back to the first slide. It didn't. Ah, oh, it did. Okay. So. Anyway, so he, this was the side I was talking. Basically, if I have to start from the kind of beginning, it, it, this is basically why what I said, right? Mm -hmm. There are two goals, you know, see if the data is, is, is helps in good modeling and if not, fix it. And then I was saying, you know, giving an example, are there missing values? This is how we fix it. Are there attributes with outliers? This is how we fix it. Are there lots and lots of correlated groups of attributes? You know, this is one way to fix it. Are there, you know, learning algorithms don't handle high dimensionality very well, high cardinality very well, right? So, so are there, is there a categorical attribute with like 279 values? It's, it's not going to be very, very good. So can I encode a lot of values into, into some small number of values, right? So that's, that's the purpose of doing data analysis for modeling. When you, you, you take the data, you see if it's clean, if it's not, you do something to fix it, right? So, oh, I didn't move. Huh? <laughs> Okay, do you want to operate from there? 
is it it's showing your screen no it's it's mirroring your screen huh so you are on this way i was on this slide yeah no Anandia, can you try using the arrows to progress the slides? What? Wait, you want me to present from here? No, 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 it's fine. Huh? Can you present from there and stay? Okay. Sorry, sorry, folks. This is okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so you're now on there, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so what I showed you was fairly high level, right? I mean, this that's what we do. But now I just wanted to give you a slightly better idea of how does data analysis fit into the machine learning pipeline, right? So, so. By the way, this is, um, you know, I, at, at, there was a time when I used to teach both the grad and undergrad AI course at Georgia Tech, long, long, long time ago. So this and is India. actually a extra slide from my class at that time, 20 years ago. So it still still applies, right? So so if we, let's let's build a pipeline, right? So let's let's look at how, how, you know, so you have base data. So to build a model, the first thing you do with, with the base data is you, you, you pull it in and you go through what I call an ingest and analyze phase, where you effectively go repeatedly go through this cycle, right? Basically, you take an attribute, you run a bunch of tests, some of the tests I showed you, outliers, missing values. So you you analyze it, hey, and you assess its health, and then you take a remedial action, right? So you say, hey, are there lots of missing values? 70% um, missing values, is it fixable? No the treatment action is throw it away. Or are there missing values? There are 20% missing values. The treatment action is do I impute, right? So I repeatedly go through this. And then what comes out of the of, of this is sort of clean model ready data, right? Data that you can use to model on. At this stage, you're going to create, uh, you know, I heard a lot of talk about this earlier on. You're going to create features. And just, just you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on feature creation because that's not the topic of this. But features are effectively, you know, features are also data, as most of you know. But it turns out that data in its base form is not consumable by models. Right? Data has to be transformed into the specialized artifacts called features. So, so this clean data is then used to do feature creation. The first step in the feature creation phase is something that is known as candidate feature generation. It's sort of super and then yet, can you hear us? It is basically, hey, what are predictive elements of the outcome that I'm seeking to predict? Let me give you an example. So let's imagine a large insurance company. Uh, let, let's, let's, you know, I'm, I, 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 I work with lots of companies in the United States, so we'll take a company in the US, MetLife. MetLife is the largest insurance companies in the world. Imagine the travel insurance marketing group in MetLife. MetLife is the largest travel insurance company in the world. This is the most travel insurances. It, uh, you know, the marketing team comes to the data scientists and say that, hey, I need to market travel insurance. We've been just, just, just marketing to whoever, right? And it's not working very well. Can you build me a model that's going to predict people who have a propensity to purchase travel insurance, right? Because if you can build me that model, then I can make my targeting much more narrow and hopefully have better conversions. So the candidate feature generation, you know, and, and, and the data that the data scientist is working with is a very, very rich MetLife data, right? Tens and millions of travel insurance policies that have sold over many years. So, so effectively, in the candidate feature generation phase, what the data scientist is thinking 
is that what predicts propensity to buy travel insurance? Right? And the thinking is very ad hoc, right? The thinking could go like this. Well, you know, I mean, if you don't travel, you never really need to buy travel insurance. So maybe frequency of travel is a predictor of propensity to buy travel insurance. Um, you know, travel insurance is a cost that gets stacked onto your ticket price. So that makes the overall price more expensive. So maybe if you're affluent, you'd be more likely to buy travel insurance than you don't have much discretionary money, right? So in this phase, you are effectively, you know, so, so affluence is a predictor of propensity. Uh, frequency of travel is a predictor of propensity, so on and so forth. You'll, at the end of this phase, you'll come up with like 20 different things or 25 different things that you think is predictive of what you seek to predict. Once you have done that, you're still, you're not done though, right? Because all you have done is you have conceptualized feature labels. You have said, hey, affluence is predictive, right? The next step is you have to create those features, right? You have to materialize, the, you have to instantiate those features from the data that you have, right? Do I have a marker of affluence, right? Do I have a marker for frequency of travel? And at this stage, one of two things happen. You say, okay, I have data. In my base data, there is something that I can use to create a proxy for affluence. Maybe I have the address of people who are, maybe I have an address of people who are, um, who bought uh, travel insurance and the address is a postal code and I have data that gives you, gives us, you know, average house price in the postal code. I can use that as a proxy for affluence, right? Or, you know, for frequency of travel, you might say that. So, so the one, one stage is that, so one, out, one outcome is that you have data that you can actually create features with. And there are some features that you have conceptualized that you don't even know how to create, right? In which case, so when you do that, you may actually go out and buy or acquire third party data to create those features. Again, that's the. Yeah, okay, okay. So you might create, you know, and then after you have created the features, typically you have created candidate features, then you're going to go test those features again to see, hey, are these ready for modeling? What comes out from the step sort of a model ready features? And then, of course, you, you know, these days you put them into something called a feature store, but you don't have to, you keep them around. And then you go to, you know, you build a model, you deploy the model, the model gets feedback and the cycle goes on. Right? So this is roughly the machine learning pipeline. And this part of the machine learning pipeline, the shaded part, is what is known as feature engineering. So the reason this is important, the reason we care is because data and features have one of the biggest outcomes, biggest impacts on model outcome, right? In many ways, data impacts model outcome a lot more uh, than, than what technique you end up using. And here is a very short, you know, I stole this from a podcast, recent podcast by Andrew Ong, who I'm sure you've heard of. Basically, he said that, you know, 80% of, of all the work in AI goes into prepping, whereas only 20% sort of goes into actioning, which is model building. But 90% of AI output until now, both academic research and practice, are in action, and almost nothing is in prep. Right? The prep part is almost completely ad hoc. Right? So, 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 so the point I'm trying to make is that this thing, this feature and feature engineering is sort of super important but it's 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 it it doesn't have a lot of ready-made solutions now going on so it turns out that data analysis actually forms eda forms a very key part of feature engineering and it occurs at two stages in the feature engineering flow the first stage is here so we call it pre-feature creation EDA, when you're making the data ready for creating features. And the second component is after you've created features, you prune the set of features into, 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 you know, you may generate 200 candidate features. And then after that step, you may prune it down to 20 features that you're gonna build the model on, right? So these are the two phases where analysis happens. And just to give you a little more detail, 
So this is, you know, let's dig into that. So in EDA, before feature creation, all you're trying to do is you're making sure to analyze, you know, the, the base data you ingested makes good models. And we find that there are basically three things you do in the EDA here. First is you try to understand the basic statistical properties of the data. Right? Things like you know, fill rates, missing values, you know. Is it high cardinality? Measures of central tendencies, per percentile ranges, basic stats. Second is you want to analyze the data quality of quality of the data, right? And you want to treat it. Typically for modeling, and this is huge, by the way, in statistics, there are many, many, many ways. We find there are six things you really care about when you're building models. Nulls, outlier detection, IDNS detection, bias detection, invalid duplicate entries detection, and stability. So I'm sure all of you know this top five. Stability deserves a little special mention. What stability means is how likely is the data to drift, right? Because a lot of problems, a lot of uh, 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 resiliency problems in models come because data drifts. These days, you you know, you deploy model, model misbehaves, you do postmortem, you find data has drifted. So we believe that this could this should be done in the EDA phase. If you could actually predict the driftability of data. If you could predict that this data is more likely to drift than let's say something else, that can deeply impact the features you create, right? You could choose to not use drifty data and that can help build better models, right? So, so, so those are the six things we believe you check in data quality. And then finally, you try to understand associations among attributes, like you look at correlations, you look at clusters, you look at information value, you look at information gain. And basically what, what hopefully what we are giving you, what I'm trying to give you is what we believe is a canonical, is, is an exact set of things that needs to be done in pre-feature cre feature creation EDA for modeling, right? If you do this, we believe that in a very large majority of cases, if you do it well, you come out with data that's pretty good. And then post-candidate feature generation. So now you taken this clean data, you have built candidate features, and now you want to check those features themselves, right? And you typically do five checks. You do a stability check again. Is my feature stable? You do cardinality check. You do missing values check. You do outliers categories identification, and you do dimensionality checks, right? And you fix. So we believe that if you do these five things well, then you end up with very good model-ready features. So this is, this is the framework in which I believe, and MobileWalla believes, you know, we, we have 150 deployed models with large amounts of data, that 95% that of all, clearly there are other things that you might need to do in case of certain models. But what I showed you defines probably a pretty well-defined canonical set of issues that you need to look at in order to do good EDA both before you create features and prune down your features into an optimal set of sort of model ready features. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let, so Neha um, is a senior product manager at one of the largest uh, AI companies in the world, right? So I'm going to let her talk about some of the practical stuff they do. And then I'll come back and talk, talk about really nerdy stuff. You can look at some code and things and see sort of what happens. Thanks, Anandya. So, uh, hi, I'm Neha. I'll give you a brief introduction. I'm a senior product manager at Symphony AI. And I look onto the product of building the platform, the core features for an AI platform, and, business, and power business applications about the platform. Right. A little bit about Symphony AI. Right? At Symphony AI, we are committed and we want to build one of the futuristic AI SaaS platforms, right? And in doing this, um, we cohesively bring various verticals under the umbrella of Symphony that have deep domain business expertise in, in the, their vertical uh, domain, right? And this, uh, the set of verticals that come under the Symphony domain are more on retail, CPG, banking, industrial, media, IT operations, and public sector, right? 
So in retail, we look at revenue growth, category and supply chain optimization. We look at within CPG, we look at revenue optimization, forecasting, uh, customer intel, banking is more about AML, fraud, intelligence. And industrial would be more in the plant performance, um, asset maintenance, predictive maintenance of assets, et cetera. In media, we look at revenue optimization, forecasting, customer intelligence, whereas in IT, it's more of ITSM, automation, management, enterprise service. Uh, and more on the public sector of sectors, more on the process optimiz op optimization, predictive maintenance, et cetera. Right? Uh, while we have, you know, these rich set of verticals under the umbrella, we have a varied set of data sources that you see here that, you know, that we have coming into our platform. All the way from retail, we have omni-channel and supply chain kind of data. CPG has, you know, sales, third-party data. Banking is more of the customer transaction and risk kind of data. Industrial has machine health, sensor data, asset data. Uh, media has more on the customer transactions and audit. And IT operations is the ITSM and ITAM kind of data. And on the public sector, we have the EMR and OS and IT. Right, so the endeavor here is to clearly build, you know, a rich uh, data specific model, rapid exploration on machine learning and machine building and an experimentation ecosystem to get, you know, to move towards insurance. <coughs> a deep exploration and segmentation for new insights and patterns, right, that actually deliver into our apps. Uh, a repeatable list library of domain specific machine learning algorithms that could actually be used within the platform to actually deliver insights and help our business leaders make key decisions, right? And therefore, the underlying pipelining infrastructure to be able to enable all of this, and obviously to support this at massive scale, both at real time and batch, right? And that's what we do at Symphony AI. And uh, while Anindya goes through all the technicalities of you know how EDA is performed today and how it can get better, I thought I would just draw a small space of you know a real world use case and what kind of EDA we did there and what are the challenges we faced before I handed over to Anindya to actually walk us through how it can get a lot more easier, more efficient, and the more better framework that you know they have proposed at Mobile Walla. Uh, before we head in there, quick, I won't take too much time here. This is clearly what I talked through. A quick architecture uh, slide that we have. You know, we have the Eureka platform, cap data platform capabilities that you know the data integration, profiling, cleansing, transformation, data prep, feature stores, and more on the AI layer. We have the auto ML, auto ML, explainable AI, experimentation, model registry, ML engineering, and ML ops, right? Uh, which clearly powers our data tools and our AI tools and also the AI specific business apps that cater to each of the verticals that we have within the company. Right. And the reason I wanted to actually show this is, you know, our end goal is to be able to affect business de uh, decisions made by key business holders. And uh, until we don't get our data right and our models to perform and predict well, uh, there is, I mean, the, the decisions just fall apart, right? So just to, uh, you know, draw your attention to something of a practical real use case in retail, um, let's look at a, prob you know, a, a, a problem of segmenting customer behavior, right? And the problem statement is here that retailers are investigating customer and sales dynamics to better understand the environment and the basis of you know geographical influence and in emerging market trends, online versus offline purchasing, declining value, engagement in programs, right? So you want to be able to classify customer behavior based on this. And uh, retailers struggle through the univariate perspectives they have because of the rich, diverse set of data that we have. It's really important to do the right kind of EDA and extract those features to give them these kind of insights. So the approach here is to take behavioral data augmented with, you know, uh, the interpre interpretation of uh, attributes, right? And, uh, and additional data from market and data sources to create a detailed multivariate set of behaviors, right? And data from which we can actually do some performant EDA to actually uh, get the insights. And then use a segmentation algorithm to build differentiated customer groups that actually help make key business decisions. And I'll go through that. 
Right, so the data attributes for this use case is clearly more on the transaction data within a retail store and you know product data. Right, so maybe I would. Okay, so as Anandya spoke about the whole generic ML pipeline, right? This is the ML pipeline for this particular use case, right? So uh, we have the data ingest from a data lake on the transaction in the store metadata, right? We do some EDA and feature gen generation in step two, right? And I will talk a little bit about the kind of EDA that we've been doing here. Right. Once we've extracted the features here, right, we we go through um, the post feature. This is the, the 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 step two is more of the pre feature EDA, right, and the post feature data transformations and creations that we do before we actually run it through our segmentation algorithms to, to segment customer behavior, right. And once this is done, uh, it's dumped into a later data lake, and it's these <coughs> insights are consumed into an app for you know, maybe a category, ma category manager to retail store to make key decisions on his daily life, right? So the objective is here to identify groups of cust customers with similar needs who are driving demand either positively or negatively versus an average behavior. And the kind of decisions that we would like to make is uh, if, we, if we find new and growing behaviors, so, opt so therefore we have opportunity to develop, de develop propositions to better meet and grow value from emerging trends or we have historical and declining behaviors. So therefore opportunities to rectify and respond to behaviors that, that for propositions that are no longer serving. Right, so this is how uh, we, we go in from, you know, ingesting data, creating features, EDA, to making business decisions. Now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the data that we had and uh, maybe a data dictionary of a subset of what we had in this. So, you know, we had numerical strings and continuous kinds of data here. And, you know, we had the UPC ID. UPC is basically universal product code uh, within a retailer. For instance, a code given to, you know, a dairy milk, right, could be a certain numeric number. And that's your UPC ID. And you have a UPC description, which is quite self-explanatory, a brand description, the standard units of quantity that's available, and a category hierarchy that actually helps retailers plan assortments within the store. And the sales for that particular UPC in that time period and the units of units of that UPC that's been sold. So the data really uh, consisted of numerical types, strings, and continuous, right? So the EDA that we did before feature correction with two kinds in a subset of the framework that actually Anindya presented was data quality analysis and understanding the statistical properties of the data. So within data quality analysis, we did measures of centrality, percentile shape, and Cartland checks, right? And on the statistical properties, we did nulls, outlier, bias, text stripping, text mapping, invalid du duplicate entries, and stability, right? Which clearly, uh, when we when we look at large scale productionized model pipelines, stability is the most important thing because we really don't want to be uh, pushing in models that would drift really easily. And it's very important for us to assist the stability of the data before we actually uh, get this to production. Uh, the post feature creation, uh, again, a small subset of what Angya uh, presented, we perform checks to ensure that features are model ready. So we look for stability again, uh, missing values, which is really important, and dimensionality checks before we actually run it through our segmentation algorithms. And these, so a few challenges, you know, that we faced is, you know, as you know, in India said, 70 to 80% of the data scientist time is spent on EDA and feature engineering, right? And uh, we, we look to making that more performant and, and you know, more efficient. Uh, it requires deep statistical knowledge, right? It's very time consuming, error prone. And improper choices will lead to poor model performance and therefore poor business decisions because that's how it's clearly clearly works here. So I would be handing it over to Anindya to actually take you through as to how to overcome these challenges using using some intelligent techniques. Thanks. Thanks, Neha. <clears throat> so you know, so basically both Neha and I kind of showed you the types of analysis that are needed. I just wanted to end this presentation. Well, hopefully the real treat is going to be the the, the demos. But I wanted to end the presentation with basically tell you how, how do we do EDA now? 
So let's assume <clears throat> that you are serious about building good models. I know a lot of people who are not, but if you are, you clearly need to understand, uh, you need to analyze your data very well, right? <clears throat> much so, so the fact is, as, as Neha said, much of EDA right now is very ad hoc. You decide what to do, you sort of you conceptualize what to do and you do it. So let me give you two examples. So let's take an example from pre-feature creation idea and let's take something that I think we all do all the time, right? Assume that your base data contains a numerical attribute. I chose a numerical attribute because I've rarely seen something that does not contain a numerical attribute, right? And I want to do outlier identification and treatment, simple. I just want to see, hey, are there outliers? How can I treat it, right? So if I really wanted to do it, what do I do? So let's say we are using pandas. So we ingest data using pandas. Then usually, you know, we, we, we either we know, or we sometimes you don't know, we might want to do outlier identification using interquartile range. You might want to do with mean, median, or typically you would, you would compute some percentiles. Let's say we want to compute fifth and 95th percentile. You, of course, compute mean and standard deviation. And you, let's say, you do first and third quartile identification as well. Right? Now, that means writing some code. So this is actually code segments of how you'd actually do it. right? So you'd have to do that. And then once you're done with that, you know, let's say I want, I'm going to do outlier treatment, at least people in Mowala, who I hope you know, are serious. Uh, do outlet, you know, they, 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 they decide before I'm going to use interquartile range and I'm going to use mean, median mode. And in order for something to be an outlier, it has to be flagged as an outlier in both my techniques. You know, I might want to do three techniques. I might want to do one technique. So you will, you know, based on the number of methodologies you will use, let's say you'll use interquartile range and, and mode, okay? You will define the thresholds that this is what it means to be the outlier, which also means writing code, right? Then I, I, I ran out of patience to write code. So you know, you still, then you still have to go, you, you know, you, you based on your computed thresholds and on your thing, you have to still perform the outlier identification and you have to decide how to treat it. And then you get your output data. And this is just one example of doing outlier identification well using standard package right so you know, use the pandas package clearly this is super error prone and time consuming you may just not choose the right technique or you know it takes a lot of time right ideally what we thought should happen is that you should ingest data you should call a function that just all of it for you it 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 in fact, you don't isolate a column. You run the function on the table. It extracts the columns. It figures out which are numerical, which are categorical, which are this, that. And it, it does it, right? So it looks something like this. Right. So, so that's what should happen. But what really happens is should you. Let me take one more example. Clearly, I can go on and on with null and missing. You know, very similar things can be done. You know. Let's say, you know, here I'm giving you, let's say your treatment was value replacement. You're going to replace this with value and null replacement, right? That's what you're going to get. And then you just, your output data frame comes up with you, 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 it shows all the columns, it shows the outlier detected the columns and so on. Another example, let's take now post feature creation EDA. So one of the things uh, actually we end up doing is impute uh, numerical data, right? So, so, so when when a numerical column contains missing data, and you have decided not to throw it away, you need to impute. Again, how does it work now? I mean, again, this is not exactly how, but but gives you a canonical way. You could be using other packages. You ingest data with pandas, and you go to determine missing values, right? You, know, you got to run the pandas missing value calls. And then you have to 
say, hey, how do I want to impute it, right? Do I want to use mean, median, you know, do, do I want to use matrix factorization? Do I want to use whatever, right? And it's a bunch of code, you got to write, right? And then uh, again, I, 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 I had no sure right, but then you got to identify the best performing imputer model, right? I mean, you got to run what performed best, and then you output the numerical column. So just in this example, you end up using pandas, you end up using scikit-learn, and super time-consuming and super non-scalable. Right? Again, ideally, what should happen is you ingest data, you just call an impute function. That's uh, you know that that you know your utility should be capable enough of identifying numerical columns, you know, apply techniques, identify the best technique, and just output. That's it. Right. So that's what should happen. Right. So, so what, what I wanted to end with is the fact that we like to think we have created something like that. Right. It's an open source. It's, it's, and, and again, Mobilewala is a, you know, our business is not this, right? Our business is selling features that drives better models. But many of our features happen to be the output of models themselves, right? So we have been building, you know, and, and we I like to think that that we have, you know, a very smart AI team, uh, which which is run by one of my best PhD students from a long time ago, um, and 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 we. So as we were building models, we saw the same problems that I showed you, and the team itself started building utilities to solve it. The goal was not to have a software stack at one time, right? But over three, four, five years, we built enough tools that our process became quite good. For instance, we have a tool for identifying stability. So we, we, we predict drift, right? And as a result of that, what happened was that, you know, our models, you know, we tried to refresh our models at this no more, no more than once a quarter. But our, you know, so we have, we compute this thing called mean time to instability. When does a model fall below threshold performance? I think our average mean time to instability was less than a month. It's crazy. Some models were like unstable in like five days, right? So with the stability function, our mean time to instability, it has not quite gone to 90 days yet. It's something like 72 days or something, right? And especially the ones that were like two days and now up to like a month huge savings so 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 over time we did that and then some of our large clients you know so we have very large clients who use our data you know their data science team got friendly with our data. they saw the tools we they say why don't you let us use those tools so and we said enough is enough let's put this out as an open source tool to which we have right called called anovos because it is a little late and it's almost eight o'clock i will i will show you sort of it is available on github um, we would love for you to to and, and the, the, the 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 it has only been there for six months, but the uptake has been very good, right? Again, this is not a commercial thing for us at all, right? But we we would love and most importantly, what we would love for you to not only use it, um, you know, uh, but but and you know and and and, and, the, and it, it, one of the things I did not talk about is one of the goals of Anovos was to make feature engineering scalable because we use such large amounts of data, right? And so we built on, on Anovos on top of Spark, and it, it, it sort of scales very well. Eventually, there's going to be Anovos on top of, I don't know if you guys have heard of Ray. Uh, eventually, we're going to build Anovos on top of Ray as well. That will make it even leaner and more Python native. Uh, but it's, it's you know, um, we are sort of super lucky that, that, that very large companies like Symfony are kind of considering one of us in their production pipeline. You know, they're very large. Um, so one of the other things is we'd love contributors, right? Clearly, it's an open source package. There are kind of things that could be improved. We would love contributors, right? So I'm going to stop here. But what we're going to do now, and hopefully you'll join us for some food and and, and, and drinks. But uh, Shoja and Ravish, what is Ravish? Shoja and Ravish are uh, senior and. Uh, very junior, so it dances very well, I can tell you that. So Shoja and Ravish will have two demonstrations open where you can deep dive into all of us.
I, I was going to show you some of it here, but it's, I don't want to keep you from, from sort of mingling. It's, you know, we started 15 minutes late, it's already eight o'clock, but, but they, 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 they're going to sit here and, and I, I would love for you to look at Anovos, look at what it does. Uh, it, it really does do the stuff I showed you. Uh, in, in half a line of code, it does imputation, it, uh, and, and and hopefully we can we can you know I'm happy to chat. I'd love to chat. To this. So that's 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 what I had. Any any questions for me, or or did you just want to end this and then yeah, please. So the the functions of computer showing a single line of code, maybe two lines of code. All those function libraries are there. Yes. Yes. So, you know, one of the, I'll give you a, both a philosophical and a practical answer. Uh, you know, the, the, the philosophical answer is probably almost, I, mean, I wouldn't say AI, but a large part of machine learning is predicated upon the assumption that future is a predictor, uh, past is a predictor of the future. So you are right that, that sometimes the underlying system, the underlying reality you are trying to predict is dynamic enough such that the past, the, the, the look back of the past that is reliably predictive of the future is different. So if I'm trying to predict, you know, take, take industries that have used machine learning for a long time, weather prediction. So if I'm trying to predict rainfall in Bangalore in the month of August, then, you know, quite a deep history is a predictor of the future. But if I'm trying to predict uh, how the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest, change interest rates in the next meeting, then clearly looking at what happened a year ago is not very useful. I need to look at data from the last 60 days, right? So, so, so my, the practical, so that's the, the practical answer is, you know, what, what, what we believe is that, uh, you know, I'll give you a very practical response. So we, I'll give you examples of how our features, so our features are used for, let's say, by ride share companies. I won't tell you who those companies are, but you all know, you know, all our Grab, Uber, all, you know, these types of companies. So what they do, I don't know how many of you know, that they spend a lot of money acquiring people, acquiring users. And a very small fraction of the users actually end up spending money with them. Right? So Uber, for instance, like this is published, out of 100 customers they acquire, only 12 end up being of value to them. 88 are of no value. So a big uh, application of machine learning, predictive analytics in Uber, is to build propensities of ride share spend. Right? So they would rather acquire somebody who's more likely to spend with them than not. So if they can change this 1288 to 1387, the impact on the top line is massive, right? So there, uh, so, and I'm not saying which company, but, but there are data ends up getting used to predict. You know, so I'll give you an interesting example. So how the number of visits a person has had to a non-home airport in the last 90 days becomes highly predictive of their propensity to spend on ride share in the next 90 days. So here the history is like, but, but you know what we have seen, that if you see how much somebody went to non in the last 180 days, the predictive power is a lot less. Right? So not only do we concentrate on using history, but we constrain the historical bounds to what works. Right? But we use, you know, our, 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 Data, our features are used in predicting likelihood of credit default. That takes much longer period of history 
in, 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 in the whole situation. So I think history, I mean, sometimes it takes a week of data, sometimes it takes a you know, years of data, but, but I think, you know, if history was not a predictor of the future at all, then I think machine learning overall would have a lot of trouble. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have a language while presentation we have shown that our tools can be used for IV, which you will behave wrong. Say for example, somebody is ready for a surgery, whether he is ready for a surgery, because he may have diabetes or other problems or something like that. Case by case, uh, patient by patient, is there any uh, I mean, uh, I mean, product that is available, features that are available, based on the context of a particular patient? Because when we go for surgery, that is case specific. Yeah, of course. So I want to understand uh, is that this profiling we can do uh, maybe uh, what, whether somebody is ready for a surgery, something like that. Unlike the first question, here yeah, the honest response is I, I don't know because I'm not familiar with that. Uh, that uh, like case specific, as you told, uh, like uh, whether they, they may default on the loan or they may pay something. So I do not know, but clearly AI has been used very heavily in, in, in the entire medical domain, right? So I would not be surprised if they're one. But I just don't know of any exact tools that can do that. But case specific, we can do yeah, specific, we can do Context-based rating, that's from that perspective. But not necessarily, you know, but this seems to be an area that should be highly modelable, right? If I have data on patients before and how they're reacting to surgery, I should be able to. Why don't we why don't we stop and, and, and share some food? Uh, but but uh, I don't need to not answer questions. But I'm I'm happy to speak to you as we are munching. Thank you. No, but there won't be us. Yeah, this this conclude the online. So this will conclude the. Online uh, presentation. Thank you.